We continue this morning with our worship series, A New Kind of Church, and in the complexity of this modern age, what does it mean to be the church? What does it look like? And so, rather than giving a step-by-step approach of what it might be, because we just have to live faithfully into God's future, we're talking about the heart that is behind this new kind of church, if you will, and in truth, it's really not new at all. It's an old kind of church. Um, So, we're going to continue with that this morning, and I am uh, going to read today from the Gospel of Luke, the sixth chapter. And this is a part of the Gospel that's called the Sermon on the Plain. It's a rather large collection of Jesus' teachings. Uh, there's a similar section in the Gospel of Matthew, but instead of, uh, instead of being the Sermon on the Plain, do you know what it's called there? Sermon on the Mount. That's right, Sermon on the Mount. Uh, but I'm going to read from Luke 6, verse 39 through 49. Hear now these words. Jesus also told them a riddle. A blind person can't lead another blind person, right? Won't they both fall into a ditch? And disciples aren't greater than their teacher, but whoever is fully prepared will be like their teacher. Why do you see the splinter in your brother's or your sister's eye, but don't notice the log in your own eye? How can you say to your brother or sister, brother, sister, let me take the splinter out of your eye when you don't see the log that's in your own eye? You deceive yourselves. First take the log out of your eye, and then you will see clearly to take the splinter out of your brother or sister's eye. A good tree doesn't produce bad fruit, nor does a bad tree produce good fruit. Each tree is known by its fruit. People don't gather figs from thorny plants, nor do they pick grapes from prickly bushes. But a good person produces good from the good treasury of the inner self, while an evil person produces evil from the evil treasury of the inner self. And the inner self overflows with words that are spoken. That's a tough line. What do our words that we speak to one another and about one another, what do they say about our inner life? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, Jesus says, and don't do what I say? I'll show what it's like when someone comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice. It's like a person building a house by digging deep in laying the foundation on bedrock. And when the flood came, the rising water smashed against that house, but the water couldn't shake the house because it was well built. But those who don't put into practice what they hear are like a person who built a house without a foundation, and the flood water smashed against it, and it collapsed instantly, and it was completely destroyed. These are the words of God for us, the people of God. Would you pray with me? God of creation and God of our souls, speak a word in the very depths of our being today that will make us new. And God, as I begin this message, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you. And may there be less of me and more of you. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Going inward in order to go outward. Now, as I will often do, I I sometimes will ask you to think of a question as we begin the sermon and then have you hold on to that question throughout. And so I want to begin in that way today. And so here's the question. Are you ready? What would it look like for you to thrive in life? What would it look like for you to thrive, to have have a peace of heart and a sense of wholeness? What would it look like for you to have joy? For the first words in your mouth when you awoke every morning to be praise God from whom all blessings flow Thank you for letting me be alive. What would that look like for you? What would it feel like? 
Well, I invite you to hold on to that as we make our way through the message this morning. Friends, in this modern age, we are really good at doing, are we not? I mean, we are really good at doing. We can accomplish a lot. We can get things done. We can make our way through checklists, through to-do lists. We can be busy. We can have an active life. And yet, why is it that we find ourselves restless and afraid and anxious, sometimes angry, and we find ourselves stressed and overwhelmed and disconnected? Yeah, we're really good at doing, but maybe there's more to life than the doing. In our most honest of moments, we realize that our busyness and our stuff and our activities maybe don't hold all the promises that we thought that they did. You know, there's a reason that Marie Kondo is so popular right now. You know who she is, right? Uh, for those who don't know, she, is, uh, she has this show on Netflix, and she's written this book about tidying up your life, how to declutter your life. I was in the bookstore the other day, and there's a whole table right at the front that's just dedicated to decluttering life. And there's a reason why that is so popular right now, and I think it's because of this. In everything going on, we don't know how to manage the mess of our busyness and our consumption. And we look in all of the wrong places for meaning, for healing for salvation. And when the truth is simply this, before we can live our outward lives well, we must go inward. We have to clear away some of that outward clutter to make space and time and room for the things that matter the most. Now, don't misunderstand. Our actions and our to-do list, they matter. The things that we do matter. But that's exactly why they have to come from a heart that is at peace and not from this place that is restless and anxious and fearful and overwhelmed. We have to go inward in order to go outward. I think Jesus understood this truth better than anyone. In that section that I read from the Sermon on the Plain just a minute ago, when you could sit down and read through the whole thing, you see that it's really important what we do to Jesus. I mean, in the Sermon on the Plain, Jesus actually gives us an action list, a to-do list for disciples. Jesus has things for us to accomplish. In fact, in the Sermon on the Plain, we find some of Jesus' most challenging teachings. Things like this, love your enemies and bless those who curse you and turn the other cheek when someone strikes you and give to all who ask from you and lend expecting nothing in return and don't judge other people no matter how tempting it is to do so. It is an action and to-do list for disciples. And yet, when we get to the part that we read today, we see that there is something more to it. You see, for Jesus, these are more than a list of actions and a to-do list to accomplish. No, these are actions that can only be done, only be done when our hearts are right and when we have a deep inner life. Jesus says, in essence, this, you can't give what you don't have. Otherwise, it's like the blind leading the blind around. And you can't judge others while you're completely unaware of your own shortcomings, of your own brokenness, of your own faults. No, he says, your words, your actions, and your attitudes will reflect the quality of your inner life. We can't call Jesus Lord unless our lives reflect His grace. Otherwise, we are frauds whose lives are built upon nothing. 
We must feel it. We must know it in the depths of our hearts. The way of Jesus is the way inward so that outward we can live holy lives. You see, for Jesus, faith is more than about doing. For Jesus, faith is not simply a matter of attending church. It is not simply a matter of doing all the right things. It is not simply having good morals or even believing all the right things. For Jesus, faith is more than sending our kids to Christian schools or singing Christian songs or using a lot of religious talk. It's a radical transformation of the heart, a change in the depths of our souls. It's about God growing a deep inner life within us. And friends, this takes time, this takes commitment, and this takes intentionality. It means saying yes to God, but it also means saying no to other things. It's countercultural because, you see, what it says is this, I will do less, I will accomplish less to make space for God to work in me so that when I do act, I do it well, and it comes from a heart that is at peace. Centuries ago, there was a great spiritual teacher in the church, a guy by the name of Bernard of Clairvaux. And even though it was centuries ago, he had this, this, this human dilemma down. And I think he described it very well when he said this, We human beings have a tendency to desire each and every experience of life more than God. We desire each and every experience of life more than we desire God. And so, he says, we spend our lives walking in circles and never reaching fulfillment. Maybe you've heard the parable of the moth before. It's really a simple parable. You know what happens at night when you turn on, you turn on your light outside and all of a sudden all the moths, they just go. You know what I'm talking about? Well, they do that because they think that that light is what's bringing them warmth and comfort and safety and security in the darkness. And what they, de- they never realize is they're flying towards their death. And all of our busyness and all of our schedules and all of our attempts to be successful and to be productive in our quest for entertainment and distraction in our desires to make our children the next greatest professional athlete or movie star, we are slowly moving towards spiritual death, numbing ourselves to that which truly can give life and joy. We have easily bought into the myth that following Jesus can be secondary to everything else in life, to all the busyness and all of the activities that we give ourselves to. We believe we can squeeze God in now and then as time permits. And I I have to confess to you, there have been too many times in my own life where I have done this. I stand before you not as somebody who is perfect, but as somebody who has been broken and learned. And there are still things that God is working with me on. What would it look like in your life right now to make room for your inner life to make other things work around Jesus rather than trying to ask Jesus to work around your busy schedule. To stop doing so much so that you can attend to your soul and your family's soul. Because the truth is, before we can go outward in any meaningful way, we must go inward with God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the church of today And I'm talking about the church here at Christ Church. I'm talking about the church in our community. I'm talking about the church in the world is in need of revival and restoration and renewal. The world has become very busy with other things, sometimes too busy. And Christians, we're not much better because we get really busy too. And then to make matters worse, we walk around like we're defeated and hopeless Some of us even come across as angry and bitter, and we see no future. Now look, 
I don't pretend to have all the answers of church in this complex new age that we find ourselves in, but what I do know is this, that what is wrong can be fixed. It may just be not as we think. And here's what I mean. What is wrong can't be fixed with a new program or seminar. It's not a matter of becoming more entertaining or doing more precisely and sharper the things that we do. It's not a matter of having all the flashy things that will draw people in. It's not about the latest book, and it's not about the latest YouTube videos. It's a matter of the heart and the inner life. As Eugene Peterson, the translator of the Message Bible, once said, Spirituality is not the latest fad, but the oldest truth. I'm going to say that again because I think it's really important. Spirituality is not the latest fad, but the oldest truth. It is a long obedience in the same direction. And renewal will come. It will come in our lives. It will come in our churches when we seek God above all else. Not alongside all else, but above all else. It will come when we go inward so that we can go outward. Now, here's the thing. I can't do it for you, and you can't do it for me. The church can't do it for us. We all have to make room for God in our own lives. And there's something else about all of this. Going inward with God will have to mean saying no to other things, sometimes even good things, because faith is not an I-can-have-it-all endeavor. We all have to make choices about what matters the most. No, this new kind of church for the days ahead, I believe it will be a church not for staying on the surface of faith, not just to do things to get a lot of people to come. It will not be a mile wide and an inch deep. But rather, it will be a community of people seeking intimacy with God, seeking the things of God above all else, hungering and thirsting for the things of Jesus. It will be a community of people that does amazing things outwardly because our inner lives are so deep. And don't misunderstand. The church for the days ahead will not be a church or a place or a community of the perfect. I am living proof of that. I suspect we all are when we're honest. It will not be a social club for the holy. In fact, it will be a place that welcomes all people to reflect the diversity of the kingdom of God. And especially those who are brand new to faith and those who are seeking and those whose understanding is just beginning to blossom. But the call will always be to move from the shallow places to a deep life with God. The church may not be as wide, and true discipleship is always countercultural. But it will be deep. So I want to finish today by offering you two simple ways that you can start being intentional about your inner life. You can start this morning. First one is to become a person of prayer. You see, from now until Easter, which is a long time away, well into April, we as a church are going to be focusing on being a people of prayer. The first, the first series, the one begins next week, is praying in turbulent times. And we'll focus on how prayer grounds us when it seems that chaos reigns. Then in Lent, we're going to shift it around a little bit, and we're going to spend some time talking about specific ways that we pray, things that we do, things that we say, ways that we can come into God's presence. So I want to ask you this, make a commitment to be present in worship unless you are sick or out of town so that you can deepen your own prayer life and your your family's prayer life. 
I want to ask you this, to make a commitment to pray every day, to spend time with God and to listen and to let God give you a deep inner life. Now, if you don't know how to do this, that's okay. The head, heart, and hands part of the bulletin is in there every week to help you with just this, how to begin that daily practice of being in prayer with God. The second thing that I want to offer is this. Gather under God's tent. In Lent, we're going to be starting a new small group called a skenos group. Now, it's kind of a funny name, but the word skenos in Greek, it means tent. Gather under God's tent. It comes from that passage in John 1, 14, when God said God became flesh The Word became flesh and lived among us. You know that passage I'm talking about? The actual Greek there is is really interesting. The actual Greek is God became flesh, the Word became flesh, and pitched His tent, His skenos, among us. So this pilot group that's going to start during Lent will be a group of 12 people that will meet weekly for about 12 weeks to formulate a, a rule of life. If you don't know what a rule of life is, that's where you put together a plan for how I'm going to practice my spiritual life to make it a priority. After those 12 weeks, the group will meet monthly to pray together and to share how living that rule of life is going. The hope is then that each of those 12 will lead another group of 10 to 12 people through the same process. Well, I invite you today, begin praying if God might be calling you to be one of those first 12 in that pilot group. If you feel that nudge, you can indicate it on your Connect card when you put it in the basket here in just a few minutes. Because if we're serious about following Jesus, if we are serious about following Jesus, it means intentionally cultivating a deep inner life. It means being real and authentic and not living on the surface. It means giving space and time for God to make our heart like His. As Jesus said in the passage for today, whoever is fully prepared will be like the teacher. It means saying yes, and it also means saying no for the sake of our inner lives. For a good person produces good from the good treasury of the inner self, Jesus says. Going inward to go outward. It wasn't just true 2,000 years ago. It's true this morning. So here's the good news I want to finish on. That life that you envisioned at the beginning of the sermon, you know, that life of wholeness and peace and joy. We can have that. We can absolutely have that. There is hope for us as people. There is hope for us as church. We can have hearts of joy and peace. We can have hearts of courage, and we can have hearts of strength ready to meet any challenge that life may present. We just have to make room for God to attend to our inner lives. And when we give God that kind of time and that kind of space, it's then that we begin to take hold of what the New Testament calls the life that is really life. Going inward so that we can go outward. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen.